Thank you for having me. I am really excited now, not because of you all, but my dad is here too. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, in a few minutes, he'll find out what I'm doing in my time when I'm not working. So, yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's start. Um, have you ever felt stuck in a situation where you didn't know how to decide? I have this all the time. To me, this happens a lot. So maybe I can help with this. Um, when, I can't, when I don't know what to do, I have this machine that helps me finding an answer. It's a thing that I once made, and today I want to help every one of you to make a, a decision too. Right here and right now, there's just one tiny rule. It has to fit in this sentence. Should I really press this button? Should I really buy Twitter? We all have these questions all the time. I have them all the time. <laughs> So um, we'll do it like this now. Um, any of you guys uh, is using a smartphone, by the way? Yeah, you will need one now. Um, you have to get it out. We need a camera for this. I power up the... Um, I made a new device just for today. <laughs> it's this one. Okay, um, when, you, when you're done getting out your camera, good, then we can start. I'll start the solution finding process now. Um, point your camera at the screen, and when the moment feels right to you, think about your question and take a photo of the screen. Once you're done, look into your um, photos, and there you have your reply. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't like that reply, it's fine too, because you could just do the exact opposite. This is allowed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Everyone happy now? Good, then I can start. <laughs> oh, I, I turned it off. Okay, what can I do now to turn it on again? <laughs> Which one do I need to, I'm sorry. Which one did I? No, I, I did the, the wrong thing. Okay, good. I'll take care now with this. <laughs> I want to talk about ideas today, and there's this phrase, think outside the box. Whenever I hear this, I get so confused. Um, obviously, it means you should leave the ways of thinking you're used to and think different in order to find new ideas. And um, apart from the fact that I think that calling a certain way of thinking a box is a bit weird, um, wouldn't it make more sense to first think inside the box? Explore the way you're actually thinking, what keeps you going, and what inspires you or motivates you to create new things. Maybe you already have a good box, and it gives nice ideas and solutions. So why the heck would it be any good to leave it then and think outside of it? Don't get me wrong. I understand that you have to break new ground in order to invent something new. Thinking certainly is useful, but I think new ideas are made when people at some point stopped thinking and just did things other people haven't tried before. So let's have a closer look at some of the world's biggest inventions and see if there maybe something was something else involved uh, than just thinking. Some people got inventive because they wanted to make life easier. Like Gutenberg, for example, who did not entirely invent letterpress printing, but surely made it famous. Some inventions happened by accident. Fleming left some bacteria in his laboratory sink before going on a holiday and accidentally invented antibiotics. Um, some inventions were made because people had really weird dreams, like the Wright brothers who wanted to fly. When I look at these inventors, my brain starts filling in the gaps. Imagine how the world would look like if um, <laughs> Gutenberg was so in love with his pencils that he just hated everything mechanical or if Fleming was a cleaning fanatic, or if the Wright brothers were just super jealous of birds, or if they were Wright sisters, women with big dreams, but also with kids and no time to waste. But no, book guy was lazy and therefore invented a machine. Drug guy was sloppy 
and accidentally invented medicine. And fly guys, yeah, let's just say they were curious. So lazy, sloppy, and curious, maybe that is what you need to make new ideas. I bet some of you are lazy, some of you are sloppy. I surely am both, and we are all curious. So we all have one thing in common with the most famous inventors. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> they probably had completely different motives, but that isn't the point here. I just mix up some facts and used my imagination to make up a story that fits my needs, because that is what brings me joy, telling stories and making up stuff of any kind, and then doing things, especially doing a lot of uh, simple and also silly things, you, and then share it with people, of course. Uh, you could say this is my box. Right now, it isn't easy for me to do silly things a lot for several reasons. Mm. To me, as a single parent, time is precious, and wasting time very often seems impossible. I'm an author, I write books, I have to be effective all the time to earn money for rent and pancakes, uh, while keeping up my kids' mood, while there are so many things going wrong in the world. And to me, very often, this whole situation gets too much, and I'm feeling exhausted and craving ineffectiveness. So whenever possible, I tried doing small projects and used them as band-aids. When you can't fix the world, maybe at least you can make it better for uh, some bits of it better for some seconds, for just very few people, that would be a start. So I'm um, talking of small projects. I try to be spontaneous with ideas I find in everyday life and use material I find at home or on the streets. I not buy fancy stuff. I really use what I have. That's why you could call these ideas $1 ideas. They always start really cheap. Um, they are good to me because this way I can stay playful when I don't have to think about the result of an idea. And if there's no pressure of this idea being the next big thing, just one in a million. Whenever I have an idea, but not the time, I write it down and put it in my box. I think Elliot might like this box. <laughs> like this one. Um, it's a settle custom. Um, I started using this simple idea management system when I was a teenager. Back then, I saw the title custom of author Arno Schmidt, and I was so impressed. I had absolutely no idea what it was or how it worked. I just really wanted to have my own. Um, it's just stuff written down, uh, ideas written down on um, index cards. I have different of these boxes. I have also bigger ones. Oh. Like this one I use for, my, um, for projects that already are in a more developed stage, like book projects or client work. It's really fun using these boxes because they get better the longer you use them and the more you fill them with your ideas. And as much as I'd like to talk about this genius idea management system forever, I'll keep it short now and just... <laughs> Usually people react like this, they think it's boring and why should we use this? There are apps for this and have you ever heard of this thing called a computer? Yes. I agree, there are quite, few, uh, quite a few apps for everything, and of course computers are great, I use them too. But they are also effective and perfect, and for finding ideas, I don't want that. In the human-computer relationship, producing mistakes usually is the task of the human being. So not using a computer kind of doubles the fun. Yeah. This is my favorite box. Um, I use it as a tool for producing mistakes, happy accidents, and surprises. It works like a giant lucky bag. Very often I just pull out any card and then see how this helps me going on with a project when I'm feeling stuck or uninspired. And since this is my box, I, can, I fill it with whatever helps me going on with ideas. Very often I write down words I made up, like this one. You can find it's chipslessness. It's a devastated feeling you get when you realize you ate the whole box and now you want more. It's a sad feeling. I, <laughs> you know this, obviously, okay. Um, I, I write down things that annoy me or stuff I want to have fixed or, or things I don't understand and want to figure out. Um, if uh, speech is silver, silence is golden. What is bronze? I don't know. <laughs> um, I write down stories or funny words my kid wrote down, too, <laughs> like this one. 
there's just one rule again. <laughs> there is no bad idea. I think in real life there, of course, are bad ideas, but in creative work, I think every idea has potential and can be written down. If we judge ideas before we try them, we are not treating them in a nice way. I think they deserve better, because some of them might surprise us in ways we never have imagined. I will now start showing you one million ideas. I promise, yeah. <laughs> I know there are time constraints, I have to talk really quick. Um, I mean, I, at least I can start and try, right? I will not follow a ranking order, just show them all mixed up, whether public or personal, finished or unpolished, um, just as they used to hang out in this box together on an equal level before. They just have one thing in common. Um, they all started really small and I, because of today, I just picked the ones that brought me joy by making them. And very often these weren't the ones who, uh, who brought any financial success, actually. Some of, some of them didn't even work out at all, but still, they brought me joy. I start with this one. It's an idea, um, it's a work in progress. I'm working on these concepts for a few years now. It's called networking. When I found out that I get the best ideas when I do things that aren't work-related at all, especially um, in the minutes before I fall asleep or right after I nap, right after I woke up from a nap, this caused a lot of trouble. Most of my chefs before I was self-employed or, uh, or clients didn't like this behavior. And making your human needs a priority in a world that's all about efficiency isn't very popular, unfortunately. You have to work a lot to get respect, and there's no applause or awards for the best nap ever. So I did the only thing that made sense to me to fix this problem. I wrapped up a science around my love for naps. First, I needed a name. This was simple. I just added the word work to my favorite pastime. And then I found that I needed some facts for the science behind networking, of course, because this is how you work <laughs> when you are making your own science. When you daydream or think about your future in your mind, certain areas in your brain are activated. This is not a real brain. Um, <laughs> scientists call this um, default mode network. These areas are part of the limbic system in which also our creativity is anchored. I think the brain is so cool. Even if you just let it hang out and chill, it's still capable of doing nice things in the background. These areas are deactivated again when you think about problems or start to plan something actively, because for that you need other brain areas. I don't know which one, but these are others. This is not the default mode network, so... <laughs> Yeah, I also found out this important fact, that there are two kinds of thinking. We have the vert so-called vertical thinking or linear thinking, here pictured on the left side. Um, it's a logical method of problem solving. We have a problem, we think a bit, we solve it. For networking, we don't want that. We want lateral thinking. Yeah, and tangled up spaghetti thinking, you could call this one. Yeah, um, and this already is the whole secret of networking. Um, we extract thoughts from our brain while the default mode network is activated, and then later we turn them into ideas using lateral thinking. Because we don't have much time, I will also keep this one short, um, because it's also a bit embarrassing. It's pretty simple to use it. Actually, you just have to lie down and close your eyes and try not to fall asleep and let your, your, your thoughts wander a bit, go for a walk, and then when you're not focused on finding an idea, sometimes it comes to itself. You need a lot of practice. For beginners, I would uh, recommend to do 10 minute nap each day, maybe, and then see what happens. I mean, you can only win. This is still, um, you, you just can win in this. Uh, when networking is your thing, you will, re will be rewarded with nice ideas at some point. And if it's not your thing, you will be rewarded with naps. So I don't, I think it's a good thing. Oh yeah. Um, I hope this will be a thing one day. And um, I, would, I would like to be, it. Um, I, I think about it, uh, it should be a soft skill one day, like networking maybe. I think it would be awesome if people could just leave their desks for a while and say, I'll do my nap work now or so. Don't know where this project is leading, anyway. <laughs>
but right, right now I'm having a lot of fun doing um, creating convincing data. I thought maybe I go, um, this is more playful direction. I thought maybe I should reach different target groups now, so I started doing these things. I think it looks really convincing. I, I don't know what it means, though, but <laughs> I think you could convince people if you show them graphics like this, right? <laughs> yeah, so you have seen these. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Who knows? Give it a try. Let's make this a thing. I think the world will be a better place if we all would use networking. <laughs> yeah, let me check my notes. You can enjoy this meanwhile. <laughs> okay. Good. I love misunderstandings. Misunderstandings very often give me really nice ideas. Mm, like in this case, a few years ago, I was listening to a talk about data visualization. And this whole thing was new to me. I didn't understand a single word, but it gave me so many ideas because my default mode network got active immediately. <laughs> um, by now, of course, I know that this is a common term, but back then I thought, ah, soft data, like in wool or in fabric maybe? or data that feels cozy. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not just a procrastinator, I'm also a procrastinator. So um, knitting is super ineffective, it takes ages, you can't do anything at the same time. So I thought I wanted to turn data into something knitted. So I'm, I'm, I started collecting data from my everyday life. This is my year, um, a part of my 2019. I marked the good days with a green line and the bad days, obviously, with a red line. Because I wanted to turn it into a scarf. I had to switch the colors because red and green together in a scarf to me look really shitty. So this time I um, took a white line for a good day and a black line for a bad day. And I also added this blue line to um, figure out how, how productive I felt that day. And I think it turned out that uh, being productive and doing things uh, sometimes is my way to deal with crappy days. So, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the only person doing these kind of data nets. Especially scarves are very popular because they are so long and good for towing, showing time frames. That's why I decided to be more adventurous and thought maybe I could turn a cold into something wearable. Um, and also in 2019, I had a very nice cold. It lasted 12 days, and I was, it was the best cold I ever had. I was so happy about every single symptom. Um, <laughs> headache, yay, more snot. <laughs> I wanted to collect a lot of data. Yeah, this is my very precise data collection. Mm. I, um, each symptom has its, has its own color. I pick the colors by how the symptom feels to me. To me, a headache feels light pink, and oof, nausea is yellow, definitely. Might, your cold might look different, <laughs> but this is mine. Yeah, and then I turned it into a knitting pattern. This is a, a picture of the pattern. You can see how big it is. It is longer than four meters, because I did it by hand, and yeah, sometimes I'm not good with this numbers and translation stuff. It kind of twisted my brain. Anyway, this is my variable cold. <laughs> the placing of the buttons also stands for the intensity of the symptoms during that cold. Yeah. I became a, a real big data grabber, almost like Google, I think, <laughs> because I did also this one. I made this one for my daughter. Um, it started during homeschooling. When you have a kid and the kid has an iPad, and you ask the kid, can you t please turn off the iPad now and start homeschooling? The kid usually would say, yes, soon, in a moment, give me five minutes, give me a second, and so on. And it, it really annoyed me, and I was so pissed after a while. But I don't want to be an angry parent, so I decided to switch my mindset. And instead of being angry, Every time she said, yes, in a moment, I just set a timer. Because I wanted to know how long is a moment. 
Um, as you can see, moment, uh, the length of a moment varies a lot between one minute and over an hour. Yeah, I made the sleeves extra long, not just because I collected so many moments, but also to annoy her a bit <laughs> when she's wearing it on the iPad. <laughs> you could call this soft revenge, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes these ideas, these personal projects just entertain um, one or two people in the world. Does this make an idea less valuable? I don't think so. Good, let's see what's next. Surprise me, Lena, with a checkbox diary. Yeah, this is an idea that started super small. I didn't expect anything of it. Um, it was a bonkers idea that accidentally turned into my business. It started a few years ago, let's say 20 years. <laughs> Um, we were sitting with some friends, it was late, we were a bit tipsy, and a friend said, I would love to write a diary, but writing takes too much time. I'd prefer something quick. So I suggested, maybe you should use a diary with checkboxes and fill in the blanks and so on. And we laughed about it because um, they thought it was stupid, and back then these books didn't exist. And that was it for them, not for me. Click, clicker, yeah. <laughs> I was so excited, and when I was home, I started to doing the first text for this book. Um, I wanted to surprise my friend and um, do something nice for her and uh, tell her, look, uh, writing a diary is super easy. I used the first font that came up, so don't. <laughs> 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 then another friend wanted one of these books too, so I made more of these and switched to uh, more to my handwriting, because I thought it looked more like a diary when something is already written by hand. Um, I sold them also in my web shop. Um, a while later, an editor from a publishing company saw this and asked me if it was okay for me if it was published as a company, and I thought, why not? So a while later, it was in the bookshops, and people actually bought it, and in the next month, it sold more than 70,000 copies. <laughs> Yeah, and it didn't stop there. Um, it also led to follow-up contracts and uh, translations to other languages, like this English one, where I also did the handwriting. And people on Amazon said, weird font, we don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's my handwriting. Or Chinese version, which I did not write myself. I can't write this language. And since then, I just went on making books. So these are all I've made so far. <laughs> Yeah, of course, none of this happened overnight. It was around seven years from the first drunk idea until the first book was printed, and not every drunk idea became such a success. But I learned something there. It's essential for creative people to take your own ideas seriously and not just dismiss them as nonsense, because a silly idea can become a job. Yeah, and this idea was the exact opposite. It was a thing I thought might be good and um, had high expectations and that were not so fulfilled so far. It happened when I was lazy in my sloppy studio and curiously asked myself, what happens when? So I might have uh, invented the perfect product. Cheap, useless, kids will love it, parents will hate it. It's a lolly brush. <laughs> um, it's, um, hi, Dad. <laughs> He was a dentist, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a toothbrush covered in sugar crystals. I thought it might be a good idea if a kid could just, or a person using this, could just nibble away all the candy and then afterwards use the brush for brushing the teeth. So, Of course, this product is not very cool. It's not sustainable and it's bad for the health. These things can happen when you stop thinking and start doing, by the way. But it's, I think it's okay, there was no harm done. I would prefer it to look more like this, but I, I still think it has some potential. Maybe, maybe I will do something with this one day. Or something, someone steals this idea and gets rich with it. <laughs> Who knows? Making it was fun, and I loved uh, seeing how, how the, crist uh, the, the crystals grow, and I still think it looks beautiful. Yeah. Next. <laughs> this card says... Um, a book that writes itself. 
So my motivation for this project was um, laziness. I thought my initial idea was if the person using this book has to do all the work, it would be less work for me. Uh, I invented a genre which is now called Kritzel Krimi. It's doodle crime books for kids. The um, main character is uh, he he's a pencil or a pen. He once was used by a crime author. Uh, she used him for writing her books. So after she disappears, he, de he decides to solve his own crime because he has a lot of theoretical experience about crime stories. When he discovers the kid reading the book, first he is scared, but then he thinks, oh, good kid, now you are here, you could work for me and be my assistant. I will call you number two and you work for me. <laughs> The kid has superpowers, whatever it draws gets real in the story and can, can be used by the detective, and together they solve this crime. There are a lot of ways for the kid to interact with the people in the book. There are mazes, riddles, lots of spaces for doodling and uh, rhymes, even rhymes to complete. And in the end, this whole thing turned out to be the most work I ever had for a book. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately. It didn't write itself at all. I did. Of course, I did it, yeah. I made the illustrations, the texts, and everything. But still, um, it brought me joy, and it was really fun to add all the stupid details and funny details. I could, I could go wild in it, since this was more my idea. And the cool thing is, since the idea card is so vague, it can be, it can just go back to the box and be ready for future use. Maybe one day I will find an idea for a book that writes itself. The thing that, this, uh, that inspires me a lot is when I'm annoyed by things or when I dislike stuff. This is some thing I would call reverse inspiration. And when I, when I see them, I want to change them into something less hateable. Um, an example. I have a love-hate relationship with inspirational quotes. They bother me. They are everywhere. They talk to us from mugs, walls, shirts, and obviously they exist to inspire people somehow, but I don't know. I, I always don't know who's talking there to me and why do they sound like orders. I mean, enjoy the little things. What does it even mean, little things? Cells or atoms? Am I also allowed to enjoy big things like mountains or elephants? Yeah. So um, this, um, I get a lot of ideas from these inspirational quotes. I made this thing to, so people can find out what else of random stuff they could enjoy. And unfortunately, I really get a lot of things, uh, a lot of new ideas from inspirational quotes. So you could say these quotes do work, but maybe not in the way they actually intended. So they, they um, trigger some kind of twisted re reverse inspiration. But I save all my quote-related ideas because maybe one time their day will come when I keep calm and carry on while doing more of the things I love. <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> okay, this is an, a nice idea. I like to entertain people with nonsense, and this is a, an idea you could try yourself later if you want to. It's a quick idea. It doesn't require equipment, just the, your phone it requires. I used for this Instagram stories and GIFs other people made and turned GIFs other people made into poems and call this millennial poems. I'll show my, some of my favorites. Stress and hustle every day. Please depression, go away. <laughs> it's moving poems. <laughs> On my Amazon wish list, strength and courage, hope and love, booze and nachos, sometimes laugh. When I look into your eyes, it hits me with surprise. All I want are fries. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun. You could try this one day. There are so many gifts. Just um, find some that rhymes and make your own poems. Of course, I also like to entertain people with serious stuff. And for this example, I combined two ideas. A friend of mine showed me a picture of a large crowd of people who gathered in front of the Mona Lisa at Louvre to take selfies. Mona Lisa is this, I don't know, not very big, and the crowd always so huge, and I thought how funny it was if the Mona Lisa was even smaller. I combined it with this card. Think inside the box. Some boxes are okay. 
And then I made this. It's, um, I, I, I turned it into a series of animations, tiny reimagined works of art in a magical box. Um, and I used a very small box, I used a matchbox. And I used really uh, famous paintings, so if you recognize this painting, you can just shout it to me and let me know and show off that you know it. It's that simple. <laughs> okay, next one is a bit harder, but maybe some of you know this too. Always just take on uh, any material that kind of resemble the painting, and then they are all shaken into place. Way quicker than the original, because I bet Monet it took longer than 35 minutes to draw his painting. Uh, 35 seconds, actually. <laughs> okay, and the last one. This is really hard, but it, it looks so nice. Maybe some knows it. how people respond to this project. Um, kids always ask me, where did you buy these pencils? <laughs> <laughs> and art teachers um, write me that they showed th them to their classes and they now make their own animations, which I really like. And some of these boxes were shown in a museum in Madrid to encourage kids to play with, to experiment with art. And this uh, small idea from the box has become such a nice long-term project that made um, I met so many cool people after I started sharing this, and I also like that it brightened up a few people's days for a few seconds. Yeah, you see so many different and surprising things can happen once you start experimenting with your own ideas. You don't need fancy material or expensive equipment. Surely you need some time, and then give yourself permission to explore your own one-dollar ideas without thinking much about the results. No one has to be effective all the time. Sometimes it's okay to be sloppy as Fleming or lazy as letterpress guy. Just explore your box and fill it with everything you need to, to create and make ideas and then think inside or outside or above or below that box. Uh, it's up to you. But please keep keep. P please keep creating and telling stories, and yeah, because I think we all need these little band-aids now more than ever. I feel a bit sorry because I promised a million ideas, and now I just managed to fit in eight. Yeah, <laughs> but maybe I can make it up to you by confessing that I actually do have a one million dollar idea, and it gets even better because. Um, you have my official permission to copy it and use it for yourself, if you want to. It's a super long-term project with absolutely uncertain outcome, though. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I try to become a lot of millionaire with money I find on the streets. <laughs> so far, I have collected a little over nine euros in the last five years, so this still might take some time, but it already gave me so much. Um, I found new ideas because a lot of really weird things happen when I pick up coins from streets or puddles. I had hours and hours of really nice conversation with my daughter about what we will do with all the money we win. She wants to buy houses for homeless people and a pony. <laughs> so this isn't just a jar of coins, it's a jar of possibilities. 
And if it does work out one day, I will have the best story to tell. <laughs> yeah. And now you could try the same. Good luck. <laughs>